ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for inviting me and having me. Uh, as you can see from the title, uh, it, which is too general, I'm not going to talk about all our research, of course, but I'm going to talk about one specific uh, aspect of what we do. First, I would like to introduce uh, a little history into what we do. Um, Hungarian Egyptology uh, first worked in Egypt in 1907, which is uh, more than 100 years ago, but we didn't have a continuous um, <coughs> work, so we, we didn't have mission after mission after mission like other uh, foreign missions. But unfortunately, after the 19, 1907 excavation, we only partook in the UNESCO campaign in, in the Nubian salvage uh, operation, and then uh, for a long time, nothing. So even Hungarian Egyptologists at home, they tried to get uh, us involved. Uh, politics, economy, you know, everything, you know, they always stopped. So it was really a very, very big breakthrough when my professor and my second, uh, last uh, uh, predecessor as professor of Egyptology, uh, Laszlo Kakushi, finally could start working in 1983 here in Thebes or at El Hoka. Uh, he chose a tomb, uh, Theban tomb 32, uh, from the time of Ramses II, which he thought was a very small tomb, which we could do in one or two seasons, and then we could go on to the next project. What he saw, uh, as he said, when he went inside this very small room, he saw the Anubis jackal, which he liked, and said, okay, this is a very nice small tomb. The uh, problem... Uh, what turned out was that this tomb was actually not small, a small tomb, but one of the largest private tombs from the reign of Ramses II. It actually has uh, a very uh, large area of, of forecourts, inner areas, sloping passage, uh, burial chamber, etc., etc. And the owner is well known from the little statue now in the Cairo Museum. This was found in the Cairo Cachet. So it has long been known. Uh, it's in the it's uh, on exhibition at the Cairo Museum. Um, from 1995, uh, the mission at uh, at Hoka actually branched out, and uh, some of the people you see there uh, they started their own missions. Among them, uh, myself. In 95, I went to, to move on to Sheikh Abdel Gurna, while my other colleagues, they stayed at uh, Hoka and are now doing areas of, of uh, southern Hoka there uh, today. The 1983 uh, beginning of the excavation coincided with a time when uh, Theban uh, tomb archaeology was picking up. Before that, in the 60s, it, uh, there was not much interest, I have to say. Uh, interest was generated first in the 70s by Dieter Arnold, who excavated Middle Kingdom tombs in, in the Asasif and Dera Bakri area. And he's the one who initiated, uh, let's say, uh, the archaeology of undecorated tombs. So it, it became now uh, something which most everybody must do, that we don't really only consider the decoration of the tombs, but we also look at the finds, the small finds, the, the dust and all the small pieces, and we, we do a much more uh, contextual uh, approach. So, in the eight, 1983, this also uh, brought with it the first excavations in, in Memphis, in the Saqqara necropolis. And what happened in the 80s was that a, a tomb type was actually discovered by Egyptology, what today we call the Temple Tomb, or the New Kingdom Temple Tomb, which actually looks like a New Kingdom Temple, like the Ramesseum or any other tombs, uh, as temples you know. Uh, a feature which uh, you can see, this is the tomb 32 of Jehutimus with the two courts, the inner area, the sloping passage, the burial chamber, and, and the mud brick pyramid above it. These are all the constituent elements you need for a proper uh, temple tomb. But this was not invented here in Thebes. For a long time, because Theban, the Theban necropolis uh, had you know, many more standing architectural remains, everybody thought that this was something typically Theban. With the Saqqara excavations, uh, it turned out that this type of, of private elite high status tomb or burial type was actually, let's say, invented in, in, in the, in the post-Amarna period when the Amarna court with Tutankhamun moves back to Memphis. 
and the, and with him moved the elite as well, like Horam, Hermaya, and all these famous uh, people of the post modern period. They are the ones who start constructing these type of tombs. The difference between the Saqqara and the Memphite tombs are that at Saqqara, of course, you have a flat plateau, so you had to build the whole up superstructure of the tombs as standing architecture. So you're going to have pylons, courts, and everything, <coughs> and with the chapel at the end also built. On the other hand, in Theban necropolis, you have, the, of course, the tradition of, of having rock cut tombs. So the Ramesside architects came up, actually, with a brilliant solution, uh, one which is also known from, actually, temple architecture, because you have this in Nubia, in Gerf Hussein, and other places, where, actually, half of the temple, or in this case, tomb, is inside the mountain, the other half is outside. This is what we call the hemispeos, so not the speos, which is completely rock cut, but the hemispeos, meaning that half is out, half is in. So this was a brilliant solution, but it's an adaptation of the, the new trendy uh, Saqqara type. So this is what happened, uh, and this is what um, our mission has been working on, and as I said, this area is now under two of our projects are still working in this uh, area. Now to move on from, uh, from history to a little uh, older history. This is a very famous passage from Papyrus Abbott. Uh, I'm going to read a translation of, uh, of it. It says that the tombs and burial chambers in which the blessed ones of old, the citizenesses and the men of the land, rest on the west of Thebes. This is, of course, in the, the commission is talking about what they are finding when they are inspecting the tombs. It was found that the thieves had violated them all having turned their owners out of their inner and outer coffins so that they were cast out on the desert, they having stolen their funeral equipment which had been given to them along with the gold, silver, and adornments which had been in their inner coffins." End of quote. So, according <coughs> to Papyrus Abbott, uh, the Theban necropolis was completely looted at the end of, of the 20th dynasty, that is, uh, in the reign of Ramses IX. We are in the reign of Ramses now, if I am right. <coughs> uh, a question uh, does arise, though, that if uh, this is true, if people were looting and the cemetery was completely looted, then why do you still have tombs being made? Why do you have the royal tombs in the body still being constructed? Why do you have, for instance, uh, tomb, the owner of tomb TT65, where, where we are working, Right in the middle of Sheikh Abdel Gurna, you can find uh, hardly any less visible places. You know, you can see this from everywhere, actually. Why is he constructing a tomb for himself in the most visible place? Why is, and this is the German excavations you probably all know, why are the high priests Ramesses Nacht and Amenhotep, the famous Amenhotep, building a large temple-like construction at Dira Abu Naga near the Asasif? Why is all this going on? when everybody's supposed to be scared and afraid and, you know. Yeah. So uh, the problem is that, what, how do you solve this problem at the same time? Well, first of all, uh, just to go back to this uh, picture, uh, we have to know that from philology now, we know, I mean, we, it has been proven that this tomb in Egyptian were called Mahats. You know, it's uh, fairly well known, but now we know that actually this type of tomb is the Mahat, not the other types. And we also know from the quote and from other philological passages that basically uh, to own a mahat, if you had a mahat, then you were uh, one belonging to the elite, which is the hezu and the veru. So you became immediately a member of the veru or the hezu if you possessed a tomb. So if you uh, wanted to lose your status, mm -hmm. then you gave up having a tomb like this. If you gave up this, then it meant that you were actually confessing that you are, as an elite, you are incapable of controlling the situation. Tell me uh, which society or which elite is going to say, sorry, the, the robbers are better than us, so we give up. This is going to come actually at the end of the 21st dynasty, when they do give it up. But that's a different story, because there we have civil war and, and uh, many other aspects. One thing is that what we have here is a kind of dynamic where you have one kind of pressure from society uh, and the, uh, the other from the side of the elite. The elite are not going to say that we cannot control. We have to do it and we're going to build and keep this. For how long? That was another matter. So um, 
in general, I'm going to talk about the 20th dynasty because that's my uh, area of, of research and the tomb where I'm going to show you in more detail, 65, of course, dates to the, uh, this period. But first, a little uh, the sociology of, of Thebes in, in this period. We are talking about the time from Setnak to Ramses XI, of course. This is roughly a hundred years uh, period. So it's quite short in terms of, of other dynasties. And what we have to say and establish that the Theban necropolis by this time had changed. It was no more a court necropolis. It was basically a private necropolis of the city of Thebes. In the, in the 18th dynasty, it's, uh, it's quite clear that the Theban necropolis was for the royal burials and for the court, and all the elite was here. In the Ramesside period, in the early Ramesside period, this started to change. So some of the elite still got buried here, others buried, were buried in Saqqara, and again, others were actually like viziers <coughs> buried in their hometown cemeteries. So in the 19th dynasty, you have this dispersal of the elite into different dynasty, I mean cemeteries, or necropolis. And then you have uh, Thebes in, uh, coming to the 20th dynasty, which is now basically, as I said, the, remains the necropolis of Thebes. Now what does this mean? How did the population of Thebes look like? Actually, what, if we just look at the tombs, what we can see is that the Theban uh, the, the, uh, the profile of, of the population was basically everybody had a work or a job with, well, which was connected to Karnak and its affiliates, Temple of Mut and Honsu. So basically, uh, everything was controlled by the temple. And <clears throat> I just show you a, a little detail from Theban Tomb 65, which, uh, which is a part of the so-called New Year festival, when down here are actually the Karnak priests of Amun. So you have the priesthood of Mut and Honsu lining up because at the New Year festival, one part of the New Year festival involved the priesthood getting their New Year present. They got an amphora of corn, or we don't know exactly how much corn, or before baking bread, and they got a new set of clothes. So everybody got a white linen cloth as a new... It's something which I find very interesting when I see that here in Gurna, in the village, you have this uh, that children get new clothes at a certain festival. Yeah. So it's, it's, for me that's very interesting, a kind of anthropological survival, but who knows if it's how dire that. So anyway, they are lined up. So in theory, we could actually count how many priests served <laughs> in the Temple of Honsu or Mut uh, at this time, but this, these are always very dangerous uh, calculations. Anyway, most of the people who received burials or could get access to being buried in a Theban tomb were linked to these priests either as priests themselves or as people who were working in the administration or the financial offices of, of, uh, <coughs> of these temples. Uh, if you look at uh, the numbers uh, may change because uh, we, you know, everything is always changing. Um, the, the calculation I made is approximate, I did this a couple of years ago, uh, it, it shows that approximately 60 tombs were, uh, were created during the 20th dynasty in, in the Theban necropolis. This could of course move up with new discoveries. Uh, to have a comparison, consider that this, these 60 tombs are distributed for the 100 year period of the 20th dynasty. Alone, during the reign of Tutmos III, there were more than 40 of them. So you can compare the, the, the magnitude of, of uh, the numbers between reigns. So, uh, so this was not a very rich period, of course. But of course, Tutmos III had all his court beside for him. These only had people who were working, as I said, in the, in the large temple estate uh, establishments. If you look at the distribution, you can uh, see that most of the tombs we can identify are from the Dira Naga area. Uh, then on Sheikh Abdelgurna we have uh, around 13, and then uh, <coughs> Hoha Asasi we have 12, and then less of We have one single outliner in Medinet Habun, and of course that's also interesting because this belonged to um, Passer, who was a, was a mayor of Thebes. You might uh, know the, the the Shots uh, publication of, of uh, the 
the blocks from there. First of all, it's, it's, it's basically south of the main cemetery. And second, he's the only, let's say, civil uh, person, not related to any uh, uh, temple administration. There is one link, of course, and this is very important, as we shall see. He was a member of the big, big Beckenhonsu family, the famous high priest's uh, family. So he was linked, or let's say, uh, networked with the large uh, ruling, or one of the huge families, ruling Thebes. Uh, but anyway, this is very uh, unique in this, so he's the only unique one as a, as a mayor. The others are all linked in some uh, respects, and uh, I will try to show you uh, how. As I said again, the main problem of, of uh, increasing the number or decreasing is that uh, one problem we have with especially late Ramesside tombs are the states of preservation. They are not in two good shapes, first of all. The second one is it's very hard to identify uh, tombs that are distinguished between 19th dynasty or 20th dynasty tombs alone. If there is no uh, cartouche or, or any other written uh, certain uh, mention, then it's very difficult to date something. And that's why in either Porter Morse or Combs volumes, you'll always find tombs with the label Ramesside, which actually uh, is an admission that uh, she or we or we don't know the exact date where to put it. Uh, so, so this number, this is why it's always very casual, uh, a casual number because it can can increase depending on new results, if, if some, some new dating comes along. But anyway, it shows again that we, have, we are dealing with a lot of uncertainties when it comes to this. And of course, many uh, tombs are not recognized as uh, belonging to this uh, period. Just from Port was just to show you uh, again the pattern of, of, uh, of, of the location of certain tombs. Uh, you read in many books that one of the main features of the late Ramesside uh, period uh, in, in respect of tombs was that older tombs were reused constantly. As you can see, the, the pattern of reuse is, is uh, quite interesting because this map is the, is the upper part of, it says north, but actually this is the higher part of the Sheikh Abdel Gurna hill. And you can see there are very few tombs actually. As a, why? Because they were very visible. They were very, you know, large uh, 18th dynasty tombs like Senate and so forth. So they were not going to uh, uh, reuse those tombs, with one or two exceptions. The, big cl the large clustering is, of course, in the flat part of, Sh of Shikab del Burna, where you have small little tombs and little courts where they could um, uh, place their own tombs. How they did that, I'll try to show you a little uh, later. Anyway, uh, the preference is clear to, to, to use smaller tombs in, in flat-lying areas and try to avoid the very visible large tombs, of course, because those would be, of course, uh, easily attacked, except for, of course, other people. I mean, like, uh, as respect of the area. I showed you that one of the areas that uh, the late Ramesides preferred was Dirabuanaga, especially Dirabuanaga South, uh, in this case, it's quite clear why this area was used, because this was the traditional burial ground of the high priests of Amun. This is where the high priests, their family members, and their retainers always uh, buried themselves from the time of Ramses, the early Ramesside period. Uh, and of course, this is one of the main uh, tombs of the period, of the 20th dynasty. Um, I'm showing this because this is mentioned by name in the tomb robbery, Papyrus is being uh, robbed and, and he was, uh, his, his tomb was violated as, together with his uh, mummy. <coughs> the cluster of, of the tombs on this part shows that they were all very closely associated and not just by the office of the high priest but also by uh, blind blood and by kinship. So this was a very closely knit group uh, which didn't really allow others uh, inside. And this is why we find some very, very uh, interesting examples. Uh, you may know, if I digress a little, that the area is uh, the concession of, uh, has been the concession for more than 100 years now of the Yale Pennsylvania uh, expedition. It was uh, excavated by Fisher a long time ago. Then Lenny Bell uh, worked here for, during the 70s and the early 80s. And now uh, 
157 is worked by uh, Seyfried from the German, uh, I mean from Leipzig now. So anyway, you have this large area and you can see the temple tomb type with uh, the pyramids. I have to note one thing, that I showed you the tomb of Gentium as 32 we worked in. That tomb, as a large temple tomb, differs from Diraba, the Diraba tombs. So there was a difference between the high priestly tombs and the very rich elite tombs. Certain differences probably due to status and using the different architects and, and, and you can see different traditions. I will not go into that because it's, uh, it's a long story. But anyway, uh, this group is very tightly knit. What happens here, for instance, during the 20th dynasty? There is a, a well-known, or you, some of you may know it, I, I haven't been there actually, I know only this one, this is 232, a tomb of a, a, a treasurer of Amun from the 20th dynasty, or mid-20th dynasty, who, you can see the, the blue part, is the part that he cut, or refashioned. Originally, this tomb with the portico and this long corridor was nothing else than a saftum. Probably either Middle Kingdom or maybe early uh, New Kingdom saftum. And then comes this treasurer of Amun, uh, Kervas in the 20th dynasty, and what does he do? He builds a mud brick wall here and here, so he makes a little uh, por smaller portico, and then he cuts a longitudinal uh, hole with columns. Why does he do that? because he is imitating the nearby uh, laying tomb of the high priest Nebvelena from the early Ramesside tomb. So he is turning uh, a Middle Kingdom or early New Kingdom soft tomb into a 19th dynasty tomb. So you have all these uh, little tricks and, and these rhymes and, and all these re references to earlier architecture. So he's actually fitting himself among the high priests this way, which is of course uh, kind of pretentious, basically, for a treasurer, but anyway, he's, uh, he, he's, he can do that, and this is how he achieves it through architecture. And this is why we always preach that if you find a beautiful big uh, tomb, you know, cut from the rock and you have these pillars, and then you have these little small mud brick walls, uh, never get rid of them, because this is what they show, that actually this is the, the, one of our problems, that mud brick architecture doesn't survive so well. And this is why we cannot really appreciate the 20th dynasty, because they were usually building in mud brick, not stone. So if you, we remove the mud brick, then, then we, we lose a lot of information on what was happening. This uh, tomb also here in this area is maybe the last or one of the last tombs of the New Kingdom. Uh, this probably dates to something like Ramses, 10, 11, Ramses 11. It's unfortunately um, undecorated, but funds indicated that it belonged to a third prophet of Amun. So we don't not only have the high priest, but we have the second prophet, third prophet, all in this area. And you can see that it has the same type of architecture as we shall see others. This is this tomb. You see the statues at the end. And what he was actually cutting here on the Naga was something which was uh, related to his, his ancestors, because his ancestor was Amenemopa, the tomb you are going to open soon, 148, and, the and Amenemopa's father, uh, Tjanefer, 158. So you have a direct line from Passer to Amenemopa back to Tjanefer, actually, using the same tomb. By building the same type of tomb, he was again asserting his, his belonging to the family and his continuing the trend. Uh, we are talking about an elite which is trying to hold on to power, to hold on to the local roots, because they are seeing that the world is changing around them. And this Passer, he had a father, and why I'm showing you this, because he was also a third prophet of, uh, of Amun, and he is depicted in our tomb in Imiseba in 65, among, here is the high priest Amenhotep, Tjanefer the second and uh, Tjanefer the first, and here is Kenpare, Passer's father. So we have uh, him also present in our uh, tomb. This is also the new year. Uh, and just how uh, far you can go with, with tombs and how ancestry can be shown through uh, tomb architecture. You saw Passer, you have Amen, Amen Amopa 448. 
But all these types, they all go back to number 35 on Girab al which is the tomb of Bakenhausen, the famous long-living high priest of Ramses II who built the gate of Bakenhausen, Karnak, etc., etc. So you see, uh, he's actually, you know, claiming a very long lineage, uh, if not family-wise, because he's very loosely related to this family, but, but through the architecture, he's placing himself um, as a very typical uh, way of, of dealing with uh, certain historical situations. I'm not going to talk about this because this is Daniel Poltz's and Uta Gummel's uh, concession and their uh, work, but not far from here on, on, Dira, on Dira Buenaca North, you have this, the twin edifices of, of uh, what they are now calling, well, some kind of a chapel of Ramses, not the high priest of the 20th dynasty, and his son, they have found the, the, the coffins of, or coffin fragments of Amenhotep, the famous high priest, his son, in this tomb. What these tombs might be, of course the, the proof is not conclusive yet, is you know, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the possibilities that this was the tomb of Amenhotep the first originally, and this was the tomb of Ahmose and Efeftari. So actually what the two high priests were doing was actually putting their own cult into a royal tomb temple. So uh, they were really going into uh, things here. Now, you could also have tombs uh, depending on, on other social ties. One uh, example is uh, Hekamarinat, who was a, a <coughs> high priest of Montu during the reign of Ramses IV and V. His tomb is on Gurnat Murai. Why he's down there? Because uh, actually, from uh, Ustas Pathi's excavations, we know that the Montu priests were buried in the Asasif. He has the excavations there from the time of Ramses II and the 19th dynasty. So the Montu high priests were in the Asasif. Why does he go? Because he's, uh, because he's tied to Ramses III, to Medinet Habu. So he's choosing a place uh, very near to mm -hmm. Habu. And you can see the type of tomb of Heka and Neka, although the court has unfortunately been destroyed by now and you don't have all the places of the, uh, the pillars, they have been gone, but basically the, 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 the type is the same as what you have uh, elsewhere. This is also from Heka Materinacht, what is, uh, again, uh, he not only uses Medinet Habu and the king as, as a relation, uh, as to express his relationship, but a very interesting little detail in this tomb is the depiction of the funeral ceremonies. You have this in tombs, but the difference is that Heka Materinacht actually copied this scene from an 18th dynasty tomb which is beside it. So he was actually using a, an old tomb as a, a to, as a model and copied it into his tomb. So he's again putting down his roots, so to say. And then you have uh, a little less uh, well done tombs. This is the tomb of uh, Amenemona, also there at Gunat Marai. Why, he's, why he chose to uh, build his tomb there was because he was attached to the cult of Ram, uh, Amenhotep III in Kumar Haitan. So he's actually putting his tomb beside his boss's uh, temple and cult place. And you can see that they are uh, depicted in his tomb. This is the, from, from Ramsey the uh, fourth and fifth time. So these are actually you not know, just uh, statues or like gods uh, present in his tomb. And of course you have a very, let's say, uh, low quality type of, of artwork. Of course he's in Thieves, at, at this period, you're not going to have many good artists anymore, of course. And just to show you, this is a, a Cairo papyrus, that one of the main problems that everybody in Thieves, but also in Saqqara, were, uh, were struggling with, was the lack of space. You must, lack of space, where to build a tomb? I mean, when you're in the 20th dynasty, everything is occupied, but not just in the 20th. Already, during the time of Amenhotep III, you can see that they had problems with Heruef and Nefer II and all these. They had to put it further and further because there was no more space around Kuma Haitan or property. By the time you get to the late Ramesside period, uh, you barely, as, as now, you know, you barely find a place where you can build something. And this papyrus is a very interesting uh, reference from uh, Sakkara. It's a one of a kind because it actually talks about um, 
from the reign of Ramses III, it talks about uh, somebody coming to, to make a tomb in the Saqqara necropolis for a vizier, and uh, a lady from uh, Memphis runs out and wants to see where he wants to build a tomb because not to go on to the, her uh, family's tomb. So he must keep, you know, not go there. So there is actually a reference to how they were guarding their space in the cemetery and how precious it was actually. Incidentally, this is also one of the proofs, or one of the few proofs that show that you could get a tomb from the king as a, get, as a gift. So he gave you and he paid for it. So even in the Ramesside period, you could get it not just in the old kingdom. And then, you, what kind of solutions were there when there was no space? And this is what you find when you walk around the cemetery. You have one of the earliest. This is you know, where now Chicago is working. This is ET-107. This is Nefer Seheru, which was, of course, has a, a south-looking facade. Passer, the famous vizier of Ramses II, was very lucky because this way he could build his tomb on the, on the east-west axis. But it's basically, Passer was using an earlier tomb's well, and we have, I mean, you probably know uh, many, many uh, examples where you have one big court sunk down, and then you have the original 18th <coughs> dynasty tomb there on the proper axis, and then you have all kinds of later tombs dug, because this was saving time and it also had space. Nobody, you know, you couldn't have everybody uh, cutting wells for themselves because there was simply no space for it. So you have these late Ramesside tombs especially, all cut like that. Then there are other little solutions, and again I have to emphasize, because I, I try to emphasize as much, the, the importance of mud brick architecture in the tombs. If you look at this uh, example 377, originally this was, seems like a, like a Middle Kingdom tomb which was left empty or, or not used, and then in the late Ramesside, in the 20th dynasty, what happened was that he walled off this part, he cut a new entrance and made a little tomb for himself. So he basically was again using in, uh, quite ingeniously, an earlier tomb to, 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 to make one for uh, himself. And then, of course, you may know number 30. This is the tomb we wanted to go in this season, but we, are, we couldn't go in. Uh, again, the mud brick. Uh, this is you know, near Ramosa, so it, you, can, uh, you can pass it by every time. It has a very large building in front from mud brick, and it was bolted and painted, so, so you can really see how a, Amenhotep of the third period tomb with large pillars, which actually, again, with mud brick, changed into a typical Ramesside tomb. So uh, when these were removed by the 19th century excavators, by, by early <coughs> excavators, we, have, we lost uh, many, many aspects of this kind of, uh, of uh, detail and architecture. So this is why I always say that we really do not know the full effect of, 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 the, of the 20th dynasty in the landscape or mortuary landscape uh, here. And although the Ramesides, they went into tombs, they used reused tombs, one thing they never did, which later, uh, in the later period or very often occurs, they never disturbed earlier burials. So you'll find, you will excavate shafts with 18 dynasty burials and then you have third intermediate period, late period, Ptolemaic and all that. You, you will never find the late Ramesides mixing because they always respected, when they took over a tomb, they usually respected the earlier burial. So there are different solutions. In 65, what we have is that there was a shaft outside for the 18 days, so he built a sloping passage. In other cases, what you have are these very kind of interesting little side chambers where they cut shafts. So they, they simply cut a little chamber and then a shaft there and they didn't uh, disturb the, the shafts outside or any burial apartment which was in, the, in this part because sometimes in the 18th dynasty you were going to have shafts in the, in the transfer as well as well. So they chose to go inside and, and, uh, and cut shafts there to keep the two things uh, separate. And then uh, we move to what we are working on. I guess this was the context. Now we see some uh, little guide into the tomb uh, what we have here. You see uh, a letter here addressed to uh, a certain Dupuy, who was a French artist. He was a member of the Hay expedition in the 1830s, and he lived in the tomb. Wilkinson was living in TT83, and, and Hay was also living, his boss, and he as, he as a Frenchman came separately here to live alone in the tomb. And uh, so we find, for instance, letters and, which were written to him and he threw out. Uh, 
The other thing, and you might be uh, uh, able to help me in this respect, because I always, when, uh, when I mention this to, to Egyptians, uh, nobody has solved it yet. We know from the 19th century that this tomb was called in Arabic Bab al Gafa. And I always ask, what, what does it mean? I know Bab, but what is it, Gafa? What does it mean? And various Egyptians always say, no idea. It must be some local, because this name was collected by, by the people who were working here, uh, by, by Newberry and Bonomi and these people. So they were asking, you know, the Egyptians who were living and working here, that, what's that? And, and there's a collection, actually, of the Egyptian names of, of places in, in the necropolis, like Barinsa, you know, for, for the, the area and all that. But uh, this, nobody is able to tell, because it doesn't seem, it seems like a very good Arabic word, but so anyway, uh, we started working here in 1995, or at least I did. And what you notice is that uh, originally this tomb was uh, dates to the time of Hatshepsut's reign, and started by Nebahum, who was the secretary to <coughs> Hatshepsut. And he uh, constructed this part, the one with the yellow uh, rectangle. You can see that he, he started the court. There's a large um, shaft in the, in the forecourt with a burial chamber, which includes a, a crypt, which means you know we put the coffin or sarcophagus there. And then, then you have a, a columned uh, hall, and he started cutting an axial corridor, but never uh, did it. And he started decorating the, the transfer or in certain parts. I hope you can see it at the back as well. On, on certain walls, they already started carving the beautiful reliefs, high reliefs of, of Hatshepsut's period, which is very high quality. Uh, the, the last step, they never did the last step, so they never put the paint, because that would have been the last step of putting the coloring on it. Uh, we have walls which were only put, uh, the only plaster was put on them to prepare. Some we had only the Hecker friezes were done, and then we have the reliefs, but no paint. So this is where we stopped. But anyway, you can see the work process, what we, we can see in other tombs as well, that they were still cutting here when they were already painting there. So, because the workmen didn't work at the same time, you know. So, not because uh, you can't cut uh, a tomb and paint as well. So, uh, so anyway. Uh, this is something which uh, might be new to you. Uh, you see that the tomb has this socket here at the door. And we were thinking that uh, this must have had a, a sandstone gate. Uh, for many years, I thought that it didn't have any or, or it didn't survive. And then, a couple of uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go into 251, which is below us. And among the stones put down there, deposited, I don't know by who, when, there is one jam fragment which has the name of Imi Seba at the end of his titles. So this jam fragment, and this is why I wanted to have Mohamed Ismail give me the permission to take this piece and take it up to 65, so, because it belongs here. It's, which also shows that actually Imi Seba not only cut new parts, but he also had a sand, uh, sandstone gate built. Uh, and there might be actually some other pieces, uh, but you know, we, I didn't recognize it without the name, so I have to go back there, but next year then. So anyway, we know that he did that, and we also know that, as you can see, that this was the part which was done by Neba Moon, so he cut uh, a transverse hole and then a sloping passage, which was nearly obligatory for a Ramesside uh, burial place, it's not a very fancy one. Here is the, otherwise the shaft of the 18th dynasty. And you can see the unfinished state of the tomb that this should have been uh, like a trapeze form. But they never cut this to, have the, to complete the trapeze. The interior was beautifully fitted for decoration because as you can see with the 16-sided polygonal typical Tutmose uh, uh, columns, uh, with the cut architrave, it, uh, it, it just lent itself to be turned into a, well, uh, actually a kind of temple for Iseba. And in certain places that you can see the color and, uh, and uh, the quality of the painting has survived. Uh, it's a little too bright here. Anyway, this is the dark of Munt being brought in procession. And 
what I shall show you now is that uh, what makes this tomb uh, or this tomb decoration of Yuri Saba unique is that he actually transformed this Tutmosid columned area into a temple, uh, a, a pseudo royal temp mortuary temple. Because the scenes he's putting on the walls are all temple scenes. They are copied from Karnak and from Medinet Habu. Uh, I mean, not now because we don't have the time, but I could show you where he was taking the elements from the artist and bringing it here and put, assembling it here on the wall. And you can see this is a typical, uh, very temple-ish. This is not a tombish uh, decoration. This is, you know, the, the, the protocol of the king. This is what you have on temple scenes. This is called, the, you know, the, the, the caption to, to temple uh, decoration with the nine of Ramses, I mean, the cartouches of Ramses nine in his uh, titulary. So, I'm sorry because this, is, this won't show much, but on the two large walls, we have 10 meter by four meter long walls. They are all one scenes, uh, damaged of course, but, but here you have the bark of Amun, the bark of Mut I showed you, and the bark of Honsu. You have the king offering, and then groups of people behind them. Here on the other wall, the south wall, you have the king again before the bark of Amun again, bought by the priest and the goddess of the west. So you have a scheme, you know, showing two bark processions on two uh, walls. And on the third wall, you have the king and you have a canopy or a baldachin or, or a chapel. You have an altar and then you have the bark of Amun resting and little statues of kings uh, also within. Uh, what you don't see, and this is why I always constantly come back to referring to this as a, as a royal temple, because you don't see the owner. He's not himself doing it. He's not usurping royal prerogatives. He's uh, actually creating a never existing royal monument, uh, which, is, which is quite uh, unique. But uh, you can see uh, many, many little uh, details which are quite important. Actually, this bark is a little different from the other barks. So there must be some uh, interesting, um, an interesting question of where the pictures were taken from, different locations. One of the main problems is that, as you know, after Medina at Habu, we don't have any royal, really, mortuary temples here. I mean, we, have the, we know that it was in the Aza Sea. There is a foundation of Ramses IV, V, VI. But for instance, for Ramses IX, we have no idea where his mortuary temple was, if he had one. So the scenes where, which they were copying, we don't know where they come from. Is this, a, is, a, is this a scene copied from a temple of Ramses IX, or is it a scene copied from a temple of Ramses III, then fitted for Ramses IX, then copied here? So you, have, you see there are several different possibilities we have to think, think through. This is I want to show you. This is the, the scene, a reconstruction of the scene with the king, the barks, and this is the owner. He's putting himself in his proper position. This is his social position. He's this big compared to other people in the court. So he's not lying about himself. Because it would defeat the purpose of the whole thing, of, of making a royal something here. And just to show you how, uh, the, um, from even the epithet of Amun shows you that basically on this side you have the feasts of the west, and on this side the feasts on the east. So on this wall, Amun, the lord of uh, Amun of Karnak, so this is basically a scene showing the opet. Here you have Amun, be, oh, here is you have the New Year festival on this wall. And on the other side you have actually the valley. You have all uh, epithets con uh, concerning Amun with, with the leather world, with, with rebirth, with the primordial one, etc., etc. Et and again, why is he... Why is the bark on an altar shown here? And because that's what the Amun bark does during the Valley Festival. It goes into the royal mortuary temple and is then spends the night there at least. So this is what is shown here at this point. On the other hand, there are elements which link the tomb of 65 with, of course, other aspects of, of how you uh, create a, a mortuary monument. So when, when we enter the tomb on the ceiling, you have this very famous jet, the wind scallops, and so this is the birth of the sun. Actually, you know, it's uh, nothing else than the opening vignette of Book of the Dead, 15, 16. So it's just put up there on the ceiling. As you can see, we have these large, large scenes. Where are the texts? 
you might ask. Now the texts are actually on the ceiling uh, in these bands and in the friezes. These are very, very long texts. Um, uh, Kota can vouch for it because her, her MA thesis was only one of these strips, which is a long, I don't know how many strophe, actually hymn to the goddess of the, I mean, the god of the West, Ha, or the desert. So uh, we have long, long, long texts, you know, which just look like a freeze text and nothing else. And they are very, quite significant because here I, uh, I show you seven of these. These were studied by Asman long ago because these are all hymns to the sun. But what is uh, interesting about them is, and why they have different colors, are that they are different types. So that whoever was creating the, the textual corpus of the tomb was collecting what Asman calls old types, new types, and then we have two which are not attested from the New Kingdom, but they are only attested in the late period tombs in the Asasif. So these are earlier than this, one of the texts is earlier than the Asasif where you have these. So whoever was creating the tomb and its textual material was actually in the archives and collecting. I want one like this, I want like this. So it's, it's a very thought out, very intellectual thing. It's not just, you know, I want a tomb and, and let's leave it at that, you know. And, every. and not just that. Many of the texts beside the sun hymns were actually not collected from papyri, but they were collected from the neighboring tombs. We know uh, this because the, those texts only occur in those other tombs. So it's not like, you know, the, the type of text, uh, new text or other, they occur in 30 other tombs or, you know, so you could say that they, but they are only in, uh, attested in other tombs, yeah. on, only in these other tombs. It's typical that these, the ones surrounding it are all 18 dynasty tombs. One exception is Passer's tomb, which of course is not very far again, but Passer's tomb is full of, of interesting, unique uh, texts. Um, and obviously, Imi Saba just walked down and said that, of course, I want uh, this text and that text. And, and we are lucky, and um, this is her text uh, actually, we are lucky that during the excavation a couple of years ago, we actually found an ostracon, which shows uh, this is the text from the, uh, from the time of Hatshepsut, from the Hapusen, uh, the high priest's tomb. This is the original uh, one. This is from the tomb of Imiseba, which is 300 years later, and we found an ostracon thrown away, which shows how the scribe probably went down wrote it down and then went up to put it on the ceiling. So we have the vehicle of how it was transferred. This is so rare and um, these are why people go and become Egyptologists because there are moments like this which, uh, which can be gratifying. Now, as I said, so we have a royal monument, a royal temple, a memorial temple, but to close it off, this area, which was left undone by the 18th dynasty, this uh, Imiseba closed by putting a statue here, and this was the end of the cultic area. And what started behind was the Vadi Anuk, was the royalty. Because if you're going to make a royal mortuary temple from the, for your cult, then you're going to build or make something which looks like the, the royal tombs in the Vadi. So this is the Abidus fetish, and of course the person, personified Jed. But what is important is this scene. It's on the ceiling here. Why is it on the ceiling? Well, because there is no lintel, so he couldn't put it on the lintel. But this is a private version of what you have in the late Ramesside royal tombs. If you go to the Valley of the Kings and, look, and go to Mernaptach or Ramses, before entering, you look up, you're very damaged, but you see the big sun, there's the horizon and king. And this is his version of the same thing. And notice one thing, the this color of the sun, this is yellow, just as in the Valley of the Kings, because the yellow is the day sun. Before going into the underworld, it's yellow. That's why we are in the tomb. It, it should be red, but no, because we are, you know, conceptually we are somewhere else. So it's yellow, and we have Imiseba praying here to the rising sun and here to the setting sun. And here he shows as a young man, here he's shown as an old man. So you have the life stages done, and then you have, of course, uh, the horizon sign. And in, inside the horizon, this is, this is a, what we call a cosmogram. You have the, the, the desert, you have the sun, the sky. You have, if some of you have been there, so you've seen that you have uh, the two feathers of shoe which are holding the sky. So, and then you have the mad sign for water, so it's actually hieroglyphs and 
and symbols and signs put together into a, a kind of picture. And what I'm still thinking about, and I, again, something I always ask people, how do you uh, interpret it? You have two figures inside the sun disk. You would expect the scarab and the, the ram, of course, what you have in the Valley of the Kings. Here we have the figure of Maat and Horus. So how do you, you know, you could say uh, many, uh, there are many solutions probably. If you want to read it, for instance, you could read Hor and Ahet, that Horus is in the horizon. Yeah. Who knows? Anyway, uh, so we proceed inside. This is which, what cannot be seen now because we, are, we have protected. On the two sides of this now, we have feet and the jet and hands. On this side, we have Osiris and the goddess protecting it. And here's something which has been destroyed, all its little remains. This is actually the supporting of the jet. This is a, a scene type which only occurs, again, in royal context. It doesn't occur in, uh, I mean, earlier than this tomb in private tombs. Typical uh, royal tomb and royal temple. Uh, and this again is a, you can't see from back, but I can show you that this goddess and Osiris, and there was a, the Iyumutev priest actually uh, pouring water over it. This is uh, uh, the parallel scene from Ramses 9, and this is why I'd like to go. Uh, this scene appears in the late Ramesside royal tombs of the Ilmutaf purifying Osiris. So you're having a royal tomb motif brought into a private tomb, because this doesn't occur in this form. Of course, you have Ilmutaf and things like that, but not this time, not Osiris, not Ilmutaf, goddess and all that, in a private context. And then you enter the so-called transfers hall, and you're going to have a lot of uh, decoration. This is where it comes and the figures that you can see that this was done by the Deir al-Medina workmen because it's very similar to Deir al-Medina tombs with a lot of, especially Anher Hau. And uh, just to show you a little something I like to show, the difference between quality. These are basically the same type of, of motif. With the, you have the spirals, you have uh, the lotus flower, and then you have the bull's head. This is the same thing. This was done by somebody who knew how to paint and knew what he was doing. This was not. Look, if you look closely, I hope, I mean, you can, you can see that the lines are twisted like that here. You see there? Here they're not because they didn't understand. The, the person who was doing this didn't understand what he was supposed to do. So this was done by somebody who knew what the motive was and could do it. This one was done by probably an apprentice or a, or a, stud, or a student or somebody who was told, look, can you do this part? Uh, of course, this is something you see. The, the other one is way back, you know, in the darker part of the tomb. So. Now we go into the axial corridor, and we have the barks, the, the, the royal, I mean, the solar bark with the ram-headed god traveling in and then coming in different guises out. So you have the solar cycle. And you just have the bark, nothing else. So this is, and they are all on a continuous line of water. So this is supposed to um, portray something like the Anduat or the Book of Gates or the Book of Caverns, or even uh, the so-called uh, what is Tum and the 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 hour ritual, which also divides into hours and shows the bark. So this is uh, this again is due to the owner of the tomb, who is who's actually uh, using the royal tomb imagery and fitting it here into his own tomb in his own way because it's it's unique. They don't you don't find this uh, this way because usually what you find in other tombs is they take one scene and they say that okay this scene is for the old composition. He's doing something uh, else, and you can see that this is from the tomb of 65, and these are from the royal tomb. So basically, we know that uh, who painted Miseba's tomb was the same painter who actually painted the royal tombs. We know this from inscriptions or graffiti. And we know that this is Miseba, and this is KV-19, the tomb of Monty Hepeshev, the same painter. So we, we know that the, the main painter of Deir Amen Amenhotep, his name, he worked in royal tombs, he worked in the Valley of the Queens, and one of the tombs, private tombs he painted was 65. So we have, you know, the, the main artist of the day working for him. So, so he was either lucky or very well connected or very rich. I mean, um, 
The end, just to show you the little detail, you have the bark turning around here, you have Atum with the human head and the double crown, and then you have Hepri, the, the scalp hugging. And that's... Uh, and at the point, just like in the royal tombs and in the royal underworld books, at one point the deceased himself, just like the king appears in the bark, uh, praying to the god. So you have Iniseba also uh, appearing. And the end of this wall, you see two goddesses, of course, Isis and Aftis, uh, the sun disk and the horizon. You must imagine, you must unfold this into an Akhet sign. It's actually an Akhet sign, which is, you know, why is an Akhet sign put at the very end? Uh, because from, from here on, it's the, it's the sloping passage. Why, why another Akhet sign? Why do you have a, a two? Uh, and the whole thing, again, only makes sense if you look at the royal tombs. And you must know that in the royal tombs, there is the doubling. This, you have, basically, this is a royal tomb, or an older, and then you, they doubled it. So in the royal tombs, you know that the, everything is doubled. So in this tomb, we have the same thing, that basically he had one Ahed sign, the second one, just like in the royal tombs. We know from the royal tomb, the name of the, the corridors of the royal tombs, that, for instance, this is called the second passage of Ray, the sun god. And this one is called the second second passage of Ray. So this is the first passage, second first passage. Second passage, second second passage, third passage, third third passage. So second third passage. Sorry. So so we know this that they doubled it because this is where uh, it, at once it ended and then they did it uh, again. The reason for this is can be found in in, in, in several books on publications on royal tombs, but it's a very uh, important feature. And so the barks were going in. So you have this solar nether world and and very royal tomb um, world. On the bottom register, you have, of course, you have here the Ahet thing I showed, and then you have the vignettes from the book of the 68, from 17, 17, and 135. This is near the door. What does it show? It shows two figures, Amy Saba praying to a gate. This is the red gate here. Of course, this is the gate of the Netherworld. I was thinking, why they, what, what do these scenes do here? Why are they put here? Why are these vignettes here? I mean, of course, we know that Book of the Dead is, uh, they put Book of the Dead things in the tombs, but why these scenes? Uh, the texts were never added, so we, they, they remained unfinished. The texts were never added in these scenes. In the next one, you have the Ruti, the lions, the double lions, what very famous, of course, uh, uh, yesterday and tomorrow, and of course, today is in the middle, and that's from Book of the Dead 17. And then the next one, you have the Ben Bird. Uh, standing on the primeval mound again. And then you have um, four gods here, and that's the moon, actually. Um, so going back, that's 135. 135 is very interesting because, uh, sorry, uh, you have four gods and the moon. Uh, this vignette appears actually in the 20th dynasty in the, in the Book of the Dead. So it was probably created here in Deir al it's a spell which has its, well, it, it has its origins in the coffin text, but anyway, uh, the vignette and the text is very uh, new, it seems. Who are these and why? Though? It's, it's about the new moon, the rising of the new moon, which is, again, significant. And the four gods, according to the text, which is um, uh, when you find in one of the versions, it says they are the four gods of the, of the four sides of the world. Mm -hmm. So again, you have... Uh, a new, uh, 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 the moon uh, created or, or being uh, being born, and then you have the world around it. So, I was uh, here another uh, detail, these are unfortunately unfinished. And then you have the Achet, which is not the Achet thing, which is not a book of the dead vignettes. So, what does it do together with these vignettes? Um, and the only solution I came up with is that if you look at them, what do these, let's forget about Book of the Dead, or generally, what do they depict? The gate, the gate of the netherworld. What is the gate of the netherworld? It's the place where you go in and go out. That's the place of rebirth. What is the Achet, where the Ruti are? It's the place of rebirth. Yeah. Uh, you have the Benbird standing on the mound. The mound is the place of, of rebirth, of creation. 
and then you have the new moon being created from the four sides of the earth, and then you have the achet at the end, again rebirth. So you have five different depictions of the same idea. And this is very typical Egyptian, ancient Egyptian religious thinking, where, where, you, de where you describe something by bringing many, many different aspects of it. So, you know, this is uh, what, what in Egyptian logic many people have described before, that if, you know, when you, when you describe a god or, or a place, you, you try to enumerate many aspects of it. How do we know, you might say, how the place of rebirth looked? Nobody knew, of course, as we don't know it either. So what did Yimi Saba do? He said that, okay, I'll bring together all the ideas I know. Some people think it's like the Ahed between two lions. Some people think it's like a mound where the bend. So he's bringing them together, and then he's showing all of them, because these are all possibilities. Yeah. So uh, and this is why the tomb is, is, uh, is, 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 as an intellectual achievement, is really important. And uh, this is why the sloping passage was such a letdown. <laughs> I mean, uh, you can see that actually it's very short. It's some 14 meters only. It's completely undecorated. It's, got, uh, it's very irregular. It's very difficult. And uh, we know that uh, you could basically take down maybe a, uh, a coffin, but not a sarcophagus. So there was no sarcophagus here especially not in this burial chamber, which maybe we could even put a coffin on it, because it's so un, uh, uneven. We know that he wanted to build a straight one from the ceiling, you know, that it, must, it, was, it was meant to be something similar, like if you go into Inherkau or Pashad, which is a very narrow, vaulted uh, ceiling. The problem was that this area, you can see maybe in the pictures, it is full of the so-called Sawan stone. So they went, big so on here, went there, so on. So, so actually they had to go around these stock and then they just gave up. <laughs> they no. said, finish, thank you, we don't want to do anymore. Uh, that's why it's so irregular. These are later reuses. They cut some for a uh, third intermediate period, two placements for coffins, which uh, Fusion is working on. Uh, but basically, uh, whether Niseba was buried here, we don't know. Probably yes, in somewhere, because as a closing illustration, I want to show you the two only pieces we have recovered from the excavation belonging to the original owner, Imi Seba. This Shakti, which is in the Cairo Museum, we are even lucky to have. You can see that the name is not even really preserved, but the title. It's a wooden, typical Shakti, and we have here uh, this is pieces of a box, maybe a Shakti box or, or some kind of a. These were found outside, thrown down into the 18th dynasty shaft. And, and so you have a magnificent tomb, brilliant things, and, and then you have the object world, which is just this. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.